Hello Marvel Legends and welcome to another episode of Displaying Model Behaviour and I have got a big list today and a new resolution of no rambling. So let's get to it. This is the top 30 rarest, most expensive figures. Coming in first at number 30, we have the Armour Attack Batman. Now in 2004, Mattel released a whole bunch of Batman figures, as they are often inclined to do, and they all came with different weapons and gadgets to go with the Dark Knight. There was one figure called the Bat Signal Batman, and that sold very well. However, the Armor Attack Batman did not. Therefore, less copies were produced, and it is now very difficult to find, to the point that it is now currently valued at around $300 to $500. Number 29, we have Faker from the Masters of the Universe line. In the 1980s, the Masters of the Universe were one of the most popular toy lines around. Many kids, myself included, love to watch He-Man battling Skeletor every week. And of course, this show produced a whole huge range of merchandise. The Faker toy produced by Mattel in 1986 is not the rarest He-Man figure, but it is one that does go for a pretty penny. The evil robot clone of He-Man can sell for anywhere between $300 to $700. At number 28, we have a real random one. It is the Dino Saucers. Yeah, remember those guys? I don't. This is a bit of a funny one because these figures were made for a TV show, as all figures were in the 80s, but the TV show did not do very well. So the company making them actually sold the rights and the molds off to a Brazilian company who could then do whatever they pleased with them. So they released a few here and there, but it wasn't ever part of like a big wave. And basically these dinosaurs figures are impossible to find in any kind of boxed form. And when you do get them, they can go for upwards of about 700 bucks. At number 27, we have MacGyver. 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 Sorry, that's a Simpsons joke. If you didn't get that, that was probably really weird. Anyway, MacGyver was a TV show, action TV show in the late 80s, where no merchandise toy wise, was, toy wise was made for it until after it was off the air. And then these figures were released, but there was no real market for them anymore. So they kind of came and went and disappeared. But because of that disappearance, they are now worth quite a few shekels. At number 26, we have The Blank from the Dick Tracy movie. Now, this was a movie that was hugely hyped in 1990, but did okay, it did respectably. But the people making it thought this was gonna be like the next Star Wars. It wasn't, go figure. I actually really enjoyed it, it's a good film, check it out. But there was a whole range of toys made, one of which though was held back, and that is The Blank because the blank was a sort of a mystery revillain whose identity is not revealed until the end of the movie. The toy, however, had an alternate face head swap, which was M Madonna. It's a very strange figure, but the toy, of course, revealed the twist at the end of the film. So they held that back until after the film was released. Since the film wasn't as hugely popular as they had hoped, they didn't create many more of this secondary figure because there just wasn't a huge demand for it until now, when it's actually worth quite a bit of money. At number 25, we have an absolute classic. Of course, it is the original 1984 Optimus Prime with truck and trailer. Now these figures you can find fairly readily. I mean, good Lord, Transformers was a phenomenon, so they made a lot. However, to get one like absolutely pristine in mint condition, that's very, very rare. And you're probably looking at about a grand for one of those. At number 24, we have Mego Spider-Man. This was released in the 1970s and is very popular in things like kind of Robot Chicken and Toy Fair magazine. You would see this sort of design come up a lot. It's very kitsch, very, very campy, and it's kind of a classic staple of the 1970s and right now is very hard to come by. In at 23, we have Scratch the Cat. I know, who? He was one of the very, very last classic Teenage Mutant Ninja slash Hero Turtles figures made. This was in 1993, they made Scratch the Cat, and he was just in very, very, very short supply. You can find him, but you're gonna have to search long and hard, and when you do, he'll probably carry quite a big price tag. Number 22 is one that's very close to all of us Marvel Legends collectors. It is the Crimson Dawn Psylocke. This is Psylocke in a black costume with the red Crimson Dawn on her face. So rare, I can even find a picture of her online. Editor's note, I found a picture. But this was a variant of the Toy Biz Psy Psylocke. I was about to say Cyclops, Psylocke. 
and it's just very, very hard to come by. They didn't make very many of them, and those that they did kind of just fritted off into the ether. Number 21, we have Megator from the Masters of the Universe toy line. This was a 16-inch figure, and he was released in 1988 after the Dolph Lundgren movie had come out, and Masters of the Universe was kind of on the decline, so they didn't make very many, and he was only released in Europe, which makes him very hard to find. And if you do want to get a hold of him to complete your Masters of the Universe collection, you're probably looking at a couple of grand. So coming in right after Megator, we have Titus, the other half of this pair. Titus, again, was 16 inches tall and only released in Europe. So he is very hard to come by and carries a heavy price sticker. Sticking with the Masters of the Universe, we now have Laser Power He-Man. Again, only released in Europe. It's He-Man with a kind of a Star Wars looking laser sword. It looks kind of like a push pop, if you remember those. I remember push pops. But yeah, very hard to come by, European exclusive, and will fetch a hefty price tag. At number 18, we go back to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with the Technodrome. This would have been my dream toy to have as a kid in 1990 or even in 2021. It was from obviously the cartoon show and it was the Krang Technodrome. And the one of the reasons of many as to why it's so expensive is it came with so many weapons and attachments and extras and little things that of course can be lost over time. So finding a full completely kitted out Technodrome will probably go for a couple of thousand pounds. At number 17 we have the Green Beret G.I. Joe. This was released in 1966 and it was because it came with so many accessories and weapons and extras just like the Technodrome. It's not so much the rarity of the figure but it's the rarity of finding it complete that makes it incredibly sought after. Number 16 is the Marvel Mania Ghost Rider. Now this figure came with two different heads, so you could have either the Ghost Rider or Johnny Blaze. And of course, as soon as you have anything that can be removed from a figure, it becomes very difficult to find one that is complete. And this one, now that it's going back quite a few years now, is very hard to come by, and a lot of people are still after it. For number 15, we go to Star Wars with Yak Face. Yep, this was a guy who just appeared for a cup of coffee in Return of the Jedi, one of the many Denzians in Jabba the Hutt's palace. And that's one of the reasons why he's so rare, because they didn't make very many of him. This figure was made in 1985, so this was a couple of years after Return of the Jedi, so Star Wars mania was really dying down quite a bit, so they didn't make very many, and he's an obscure character, so therefore it makes him very hard to find. Number 18 is the Vinyl Cape Jawa. This was released in 1978 as part of the original toy line, but after the first wave, Kenner decided to make the cape out of cloth because they thought that the vinyl looked cheap, and it did. So they made the right choice, and the original ones with the vinyl capes now are very hard to come by. Number 13 is one that's very close to my heart. It is the Moon Belly Kamala. Made in the 1992 WWF action figure range, Kamala, as of course we all know, has stars painted on his chest and a moon on his belly. But the action figures were made with a yellow star on his belly as well, which is wrong. But that was actually the most common one. They corrected the mistake, but only a couple of the corrected ones ever actually kind of made it out onto the market. So the one that's actually wrong is easy to come by but the Kamala with the moon on his belly as it should be he's tough to get hold of. Going back to He-Man now we have She-Ra and Swiftwind. This came out in 1985 and there's nothing particularly unusual about it it's just apparently very hard to find one that is boxed and in good condition. You've got She-Ra and you've got Swiftwind, her Pegasus type steed that she rides on. And finding those two together in good condition is something that apparently is not easy to do. In at number 11, we have a favorite of mine because it is G1 Transformers and it's 1986's Computron, the Autobot Combiner. Now this figure was difficult to get hold of because it was only sold as one big box set. So it was gonna be a very lucky kid whose parents bought them all five figures in one go. Is it five? It must have been five. So Computron is now, you know, he's, he's out there somewhere in, in the ether, but it's very difficult to find him in good condition fully assembled and ready to go. So Computron is a good one for the list. And kicking off our top 10, we have the 2006 Toy Biz Blue Wasp. 
Now this is one that's like Crimson Dawn Psylocke, but a little different in that apparently, I don't think Crimson Dawn Psylocke ever actually made it to shelves. Maybe that's why I couldn't find a picture of her, but Blue Wasp did. So that's why she is out there. You can find her, but she is not hard to come by. The original character came out with a red costume, but a couple of blue ones are out there. And if you can get hold of one, well, I guess that just makes you the best Marvel Legends collector out there. Number nine, we have Robot Batman, made by Nomura in Japan, which of course is why it's so expensive, because this is back in like 1960 something or other. So there wasn't a big import market. And this was a neat little tin toy and it could put a little battery inside it. You could press a button on his belt and he would like walk along. I can just, you can, you can hear the whirring sound in your head when you're describing it, or at least I can. But yeah, so this figure made by Nomura, Japanese exclusive, therefore very hard to come by, but that's one of the most well-known classic sought after toys. Going back now to Toy Biz Marvel Legends to complete our trinity of hard to find, nay impossible to find Marvel Legends, we have Silver Shirt Luke Cage. So Silver Shirt Luke Cage, just like Crimson Dawn Psylocke, was never released to the public. Although it has been confirmed by top men, I don't know who, top men, that it does exist. It was made, it was produced, it was a thing, but it never saw store shelves. And apparently there are some that do pop up on eBay for just like stupid money. But hey, I'm a stupid person. So if I win the lottery, you never know. And the final superhero on this list is of course, Captain Reo. Nope. <laughs> Me neither, but this is the story, okay? So in the 1980s, DC teamed up with Kenner, who made the Star Wars figures, to make toys of their own comic book heroes. Now, somehow a Brazilian company called Gulliver got hold of the mold and used it to create their own superheroes, which they released in Colombia. Of course, this character was then repainted, so he didn't look like Superman. He had a black and yellow design with the Flash's symbol on his chest, and of course, he was known as Captain Reo. Mucho gusto. In at number six, we actually have quite a modern figure. It is the Todd McFarlane Blue Hat Babe Ruth. Todd McFarlane, as we all know, is a huge baseball nerd. So he made the Babe Ruth figure, I think it was in 2006, but he made a variant of Babe Ruth with a blue hat. <laughs> It's like Malibu Stacy. And he has two of them went straight into his like archive, but three were released at random to the public, which is kind of a fun uh, golden ticket kind of thing going on there. So apparently one did sell on eBay for like $13,000. And that was years ago. So goodness only knows what it would go for now. But yeah, Blue Hat, Babe Ruth. It's amazing like toy manufacturers can just snap their fingers and make something incredibly expensive just by going, change that color. Boof, out to the market. Wish I could do that. Now, number five is a bit of a funny one because it was never actually produced and that's why it's so expensive. It is the LJN prototype rubber Hulk Hogan figure. So LJN, we're gonna make a whole bunch of these with Macho Man and Andre the Giant, and of course, the Hulk Hogan, but they went out of business. So they had this, they had this, this made, but it was just never actually mass produced. And apparently it goes for like 25 Gs or something like that. Pretty crazy. More than Hogan can charge for an appearance these days. But it's still a, probably the rarest wrestling action figure out there. Unless there's one rarer, in which case, let me know. Number four, we're going back to Star Wars with the telescoping lightsaber Darth Vader. So these were made as part of the original 1978 toy line. But of course, as we all remember being kids who are, you know, still nearly 40 now, that the Kenner toys had like the, the lightsaber that came out of the hand, but it was just one single piece. But originally they had telescopic lightsabers. So it was like, boop, and then boop. But Kenner decided, no, these are too flimsy. It needs to just be one thing. So that's what they changed it to. But there are some telescopic lightsabers still out there. And boy, if you get one of those, you are one with the force. Sticking with Star Wars, but a really obscure one now is a character called Vlix. And now this is a character from the 1980s animated show, Droids. Terrible show. I remember as a kid when Droids came on, I was like, it's a Star Wars cartoon show without any of the Star Wars characters? What's the point in this? Well, people thought similar because the second wave of toys was never made because they were like, no one wants these. But Vlix was one of these toys. And what happened was a, I think it was Brazilian company got hold of the mold and in 1988, they made the Vlix toy. So we've got a super obscure character who's not been made in America and is out there in the ether somewhere, making him a very expensive figure. 
at number two, it's sticking with Star Wars. And we have probably the most famous hard to come by Star Wars figure, which is rocket pack firing Boba Fett. This was a figure that was only available as part of a mail-in thing. You had to like get a proof of purchase and then mail that off and then you would get the rocket firing Boba Fett. So of course, because you had to jump through all these hoops, it, not many were made and not many were claimed. And especially after it, after the promotion, Hasbro didn't release it to the market because they thought, ah, some stupid little kid's probably gonna swallow the rocket or put their eye out or do something stupid. So we're not gonna make this anymore. And therefore that is the most expensive Star Wars figure out there. Unless there's another one that someone can tell me about. And number one is as high end as you can possibly get and as original an action figure as you can imagine, which was the original handcrafted prototype G.I. Joe, the first ever G.I. Joe figure from 1964. And so this figure was made as an action figure before action figures were even action figures. And certainly before G.I. Joe was either a thing. This was just handmade by the designer, uh, Lavelle Levine, Don Levine, that's it. And it's one of a kind, literally. So I think in 2003, this sold for like 200,000 pounds. So that's giving you a good idea as to what these things are, are worth from back in the day. So hold on to those Cara Dune figures because you never know. But guys, those are the top 30 rarest, most expensive action figures that I happen to find in a list online. <laughs> so if there's any that I forgot, left out, completely fudged the numbers on, got the history all wrong, comment below, let me know. But until next time, as always, keep displaying model behavior. But in 1986, Computron was a, an Autobot combiner. So, and, uh, uh but... Pfft, pfft.